Daniel say, in the last days, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And Jesus answered his disciples and said, take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of woes and rumors of war. Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Good evening, my brothers and sisters. Good evening, viewers and listeners. This is the voice of prophecy, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord Jesus is coming and every mountain shall be made low and every valley shall be lifted up, the land shall be flat. For you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. This evening, we would like to talk about something that we normally do when we go to church. When we go to church, we present offerings, we present tithes and offerings. What is the purpose of presenting tithes and offerings? What is the purpose of doing all these things? Is there any value in uh, giving tithes and offerings? You know, there is a puzzle in the Bible here. Listen to what the Bible says in the book of Psalm, Psalm 50, verses 10 to 12. Bible says, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. Now God is saying, the world is mine. I know all the animals. I know everything that is under the rocks. I know where the gold is. I know where the silver is. I know where the thousand cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all those things. And everything here, it's mine. I am the one who created. In fact, Psalm 24. Psalm 24, verse 1, even says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, both the people who dwell therein and the things that are found there belong to God. And this is the reason why he's able to say, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. But then the same God, now this is where the puzzle, puzzle comes in, the same God in Malachi chapter 3, Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 to 10, listen to what the Bible says. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even the whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now wherewith, herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now, look, look at God. God. God here is saying that, look, everything in the world, in heaven, underneath there are mine. If I were hungry, I would not ask you. I wouldn't tell you, please give me something. And same God turns around and says, bring ye the tithes and the offerings into my house so that there may be food in my house. The same God who says, I cannot, I cannot ask food for you, he is now asking, bring me an offering. Why then is God asking us and asking people to bring him an offering? Now from the word, from the onset and from the beginning and from here we need to understand that when the offering is being given in church, you are not giving that offering to a preacher. You are not giving that offering to the church. You are bringing that offering to God. For God is the one who is asking for it. But God has established certain channels and certain ways through how that offering is going to be used for his purpose. And if that offering is going to be used only to nourish 
and to make rich the preacher, then something is wrong somewhere. So God is complaining, you have robbed me. Therefore, there is a possibility that we may be robbing God. How can you rob something that belongs to you? You cannot rob something that belongs to you. It means you are robbing something that is not yours. If you take it, then it, is, it didn't belong to you. Therefore, the tithe, Bible says, is the Lord's. For everything that is in this world is God's and the fullness thereof. There is nothing that we bring in when we are born. Even our very life is loaned to us by God. We are not our own. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So you take care of it because it is not yours. It belongs to God. And since it is God's, you need to consult God on how to treat that body. The money that you are having right now, the riches that you have, the companies that you have, you did not bring those things here. Even the brain that you use to establish the company is not yours. God put the brain in you. God equipped you with wisdom. It is all God's. And God is the one who needs to be given the credit. Not you. But there is a reason why he has given you the riches. It's for you to advance the kingdom of heaven. It's for you to advance the gospel on this planet. And so, God has economic principles that he wants each one of us to know. And so everyone, including the people that are involved in ZRA, the Minister of Finance, and every individual must know the following economic principles from God. Number one, all I have is the Lord's. What we are saying is belonging to the government. It can only belong to the government of God. What you say this is mine cannot be yours because everything is God's. Remember Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Even the people that dwell on this earth, they belong to God. In Haggai chapter 2 verse 8, he even says, silver and gold is mine. Silver and gold is mine. So when you talk about the gold, you talk about the silver, paper money, or whatsoever it may be, the value of it, it is still the Lord's. He may have entrusted in our hands for us to use, to use our intelligence, but ultimately it belongs to God. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. Now this one we need to read. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18. It says, but thou shalt remember that the Lord thy God, it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. That he may establish his covenant which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. It is important for us to remember it is God who gives you power and wisdom to get wealth. So it is not because you are so clever and you are so intelligent. God gives you power. God gives you the wisdom. God gives you the brains. God gives you the establishment and the opportunity. Some of you were just brought up in an environment that was conducive for you to have what you have. And if God has placed you at an advantage, it is not for you to disadvantage others. It is for you to be of help to others. That's principle number one. God's economic principle number one is all we have is the Lord's. Principle number two, tithing. What is tithing? Tithing is removing 10%, the tenth of everything that you own, everything of your increase, every profit of your salary, of the profit that you make, 10% God claims as his. Therefore, point number two is tithing acknowledges the belief that God is both the creator and the sustainer of life. When you tithe, you acknowledge that yes, all these things are not mine. God created them. God sustained them. God is the owner. If he's the one who created them, he certainly must be the owner. 
and is the one who is sustaining us. So for me to demonstrate that I don't belong to myself and I acknowledge God's sovereignty, I'll give him the 10%. Now, what does that mean? Leviticus 27, verse 30. Leviticus 27, verse 30. Here's what the Lord says, and this is what the Lord would like each one of us to know about the tithe, about the 10% of everything that we own. Leviticus 27, verse 30 says, And all the tithe, that is, all the tens, the 10% of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree is the Lord's, it is holy unto the Lord. Now, what God has said is, I am separating myself a 10%. This one is holy. And when God declares something to be holy, he cannot change. He has evaluated it and he has declared it is holy. It belongs to God. It is God. So the 10th. You may not see how holy it is. It may not be shining, but 10%, God has already declared it's mine. So when you get your 10 million check, 10% goes to God straight. He says it is mine. This is what the Lord says. Does that mean that God wants us to be poor? On the contrary, as we shall discover, the more you give to God, the more wisdom he will give you, and the more blessings he will put into your path. And so, principle number two, tithing acknowledges that God is the creator, is the sustainer, and is the owner. Where were in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, the early patriarch came to realize that since these things are not mine, and since these things belong to God, I did not bring them here, and I did not establish, I didn't even have a choice. Here is what one of the patriarchs did in the book of Genesis 28. A very important statement and a very important step that everyone and each one of us must take. Chapter 28, Genesis, and verse 22, the Bible records. The servant of God, Jacob, says, And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give you the tenth unto thee. He is making a vow and a promise before God that because you have led me, because you have protected me, and everything that I will have, I will give the tenth, I will give the tithe, it will be yours. He understood from the beginning that 10% is the Lord's. Principle number three, giving opens our hearts to receive spiritual and material blessings from God. Giving opens a way. It opens our hearts to receive spiritual and material blessings from God. Now notice here, in the book of Malachi, chapter 3 and verse 11, the promise here is, if you return the tithe and the offering, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground, Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time of the field. Thus saith the Lord. He says, I'll put a hedge of protection about your investment. I'll put a hedge of protection around what you have. I'll put a hedge of protection around what you own. And so when God promises, he's putting you to test. And he says, as I put you to test and put into your hands the means, I want you to take out the 10% and give it to me. And then I'll bless you. I'll protect your health. I'll protect your investment. I'll protect your company. This is the promise of God. But you know, the devil is clever. You know what the devil says? He says, look, if you take out 10%, that's too much money. You will have not enough for school fees. You will not have enough to feed yourself. Look at all the dependents that you have. Look at all these uh, 
things that you have to pay for, the bills, the insurances, the car, the fuel, and so on. Look at all these things. And he says, now you take out 10%, that will be a lot. In fact, he even exaggerated, exaggerates it this way. He says, look, if you take out 10%, you will only remain with 90. You are taking out 10% and you remain with 90%. He minimizes what you are remaining with and maximizes what you are putting into the offering plate. You know, that one, you know how funny it is for that 1,000 kwacha to be taken out of the pocket, thrown into the offering plate. It looks as if it is all the money you are remaining with and you are just giving it away like that. You are wasting money. And so the devil impresses upon your mind saying you are wasting the money. But let me tell you this, my brother and my sister, you are not wasting, you are investing. For Jesus says, store up your treasures in heaven where there is no moss, where there is no rust, where you cannot lose. In God's bank account where you cannot declare bankruptcy. And so he says, store up your means in the kingdom of heaven. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If your treasure is in the church, your heart will be in the church. If your treasure is in God, your heart will be with God. So he says, store up the treasure in the hands of God. So giving opens our hearts to receive spiritual and material blessings. Remember this, God is not taking away in order for you to be poor. He's taking away so that he can double bless you. He's the only one who, can, who knows how to protect you. He's the only one who knows how to protect your health. He's the only one who can lead you to the right job. And so he says, bless me and I'll bless you back. Number four, God enables us to have a part in advancing God's kingdom. He says, listen, and the, gospel of the, and, the, and the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole world, then the kingdom shall come. The only way you can be part of advancing the kingdom is by returning the tithe that God himself has says, I'll take it and I'll give to the Levites. And they are going to be advancing the kingdom of heaven. So you have a part to play to advance the kingdom of heaven. And number five, there is no greater motivation to give than the cross. The reason why you give is not because so-and-so is giving. It is not because the pastor is in need. It is not even because that Jesus is in need. It is not because there are certain projects that the church is running. It is not that at all. The great motivation for giving is the cross. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave. This is the motivation for giving love. Because Christ came, Jesus, God, gave to us the Savior. And so we follow suit. We are part and parcel of this great God. Because he gives, we also give. And number six, the real issue is where is your affection that's the real issue that we ought to ask where is your affection matthew chapter 6 verse 33 bible says but seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you you know we human beings run after these things first we are so much concerned about our clothes. We are so much concerned about security. We are so much concerned about our future. We are so much concerned about our job that we can even deny ourselves a chance of going to church so that we can pursue the things of this world. There are so many people who are so busy on national duties, they have no time to go to church. But God says, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Remember, this world is like a bone. The world, this world is like a bone. You can only chew a little bit and leave it. And so you cannot be fooled by a bone that you are not going to finish, that you are not even going to go with in heaven. And so God is giving us a challenge. Seek ye first the kingdom of God 
and his righteousness. That should be the number one thing for you to run after, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then these things that we are concerned about, the clothes, the popularity, the fame, the beauty, the intellect, the security, housing, cars, shall be added unto you. But the first thing that you need to seek is first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. Don't make a mistake of running after these things and forget the kingdom of heaven because you will die and leave these things still around. We will all die and these things will be here. Matthew chapter 16 verse 26. Matthew chapter 16 verse 26, the Bible says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Of what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What shall it profit you, my brother? What shall it profit you, my sister? For you to gain the whole world, to be the ruler of the entire universe and lose your eternal destiny. What shall it profit for you to have all the companies and all the mines and all the money and all everything and lose your eternal life. Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom and all these things shall be added unto you. God knows that you need these things. He knows. And so he's saying, don't run around don't. and forget your own destiny. Forget the God who created you and forget the very one who is giving you life, who is giving you health, and you forget about him and run after these things. Seek ye first. What shall it profit a man? A certain man went into a mine and really wanted to be rich. So as he was digging with a candle, he was digging, and all of a sudden, he struck it rich. He found this gold, piece of gold, and he knew that if he can only go and sell that thing, he will be rich. So as he pulled it out and he looked at how big it is, excitement was filling him. And then all of a sudden, his way got blocked. There was that mind collapsed and there was no way of getting out. And then he realized he was going to die. So he took a piece of paper out of his pocket. Using the last energy that was in the candle, he wrote, I died rich, and he held it in his hand. When later they were now trying to remove the people that, that, were, that, were, that were trapped in there, they found this man with a piece of paper in his hands. When they finally removed it, it says, I died rich. What shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose your own soul. My friends, it is more blessed to give, the Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 20, verse 35, the more you give, the more you receive. This is the reason why Jesus says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. But there are some offerings that we take to church that are not accepted at all. Why? Remember Cain and Abel, when they were giving their, their, their offerings, One's offering was accepted, the other was not accepted. Why? Because somebody was giving grudgingly. He had something in his soul. He did not want to forgive his brother. And God cannot accept the offering that is given out of jealousy. The offering, some offerings are given in church out of competition. That because so and so has given so much, I will beat that individual and give much more. That offering will not be acceptable in the sight of God. For God wants the, man, the fund that is giving out of a cheerful spirit. For the Lord loves a cheerful giver. The Lord loves when the offering is given willingly. The Lord loves when you are giving as you are able. The Lord is trying to take away covetousness out of your life. The reason that is the most important reason why God wants us to give and to give and to give. It is because selfishness, covetousness is engraved in the lives of so many people that go to church. And so God wants to take away the covetousness. And so he says, you give 
For it is giving that will starve covetousness. It is giving that will starve selfishness. It is giving that will prepare our souls for the kingdom of heaven. Remember, the tithe is holy. And after you return what belongs to God, then you can give him an offering out of how much you love him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the message. We want to thank you that you have asked us to bring an offering, not to enrich you, because you already have. Not to enrich the church, but to advance your kingdom and to demonstrate how much we love you and also to remove the canker saw of covetousness and selfishness that plagues our lives. We invite your presence. Take full control of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, as we come to the conclusion and to the end of this program tonight, I want to challenge you. Prove God. He has said himself, test me and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and show you the blessing. We do not have anything of ourselves. Our very existence is God's. Our breathing, the air that we breathe, we don't even know the composition. It is God's. Where it comes from, we do not know. Our very life is God's. Everything that we are enjoying is God's. So why don't we honor God with our substance? Why don't we respect God and give him an offering? Until next week at the same time, may God bless you and good night. I don't pray enough. I don't love my neighbors as I should enough. If I try to make it by myself, I just say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you 
every minute, every hour.